Today we're continuing in the book of Acts, and we are in chapter 15 right now. I encourage you to have your Bibles open to Acts 15, and if you don't have a Bible with you, there should be one in the chair right in front of you. Grab that, use it, take it home with you. If you'd like, that is fine. We'd love for you to have that, but why don't you stand with me, and we'll read um, verses 12 through 29, and then I'll pray. Acts 15, verse 12 says this, Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things, known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted to idols, polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it pleased the apostles and elders and with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, the leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles, elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some of you who went out from us, let me back up again. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with the words, unsettling their souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have therefore sent Judas and Silas who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you, Lord, that your word is clear even when my tongue and my words are not. And I pray that you would speak to your people today. Um, by your spirit, Lord. It's your spirit working through your word that points us to your son. I pray that you would do that. Lord, to those who are trapped in legalism, call them out. Help them be free today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Controversy. Our culture is no stranger to controversies. In this day and age, it seems like the news cycle is no longer timed in terms of days, but in hours, if not minutes. There's a new outrage every single day, and new issues go viral before we get a chance to absorb the first one that's on our list. You just can't keep up with it all. And although the amount of controversies has increased over the years, the fact of controversies has not. And of course, it's not limited to the political sphere, but the theological one as well. Christian history is full of controversies with the people of God wrestling how to handle sticky situations, figuring out what is and what is not heresy. And sometimes it's hard to know what to do and what to say. The very first theological controversy of the church is found right here in Acts 15. Now, although the apostles and the other believers in Jesus had had to deal with various troubles since the beginning, it had been primarily limited to persecution, not that that's a small thing at all. Uh, sure, there was the occasional act of church discipline. We saw that with Ananias and Sapphira in chapter, eight, uh, chapter 5. We saw it with potential false converts like Simon the sorcerer in Samaria in Acts chapter 8. But those potential controversies were dealt with quickly, and they were done. Persecution remained, but of course, that was something that would be an ongoing reality, exactly as Jesus said that it would be. But that was external. Theological and controversy was internal. Attack from the outside was expected. Spiritual battles from inside the church was less so. And it always is less expected. It exists even today, even though we don't think it should. It does. It creeps into the church. But here it was. An issue had developed 
that had the potential to change the course of Christian history because it affected nothing less than the gospel itself. And what was it? Now remember the context. Paul and Barnabas had just wrapped up uh, a tremendously successful missionary journey, the very first international mission trip in Christian history. The gospel had been shared with Jews and Gentiles throughout the island of Cyprus, throughout the region of Galatia, and city after city, men and women came to faith in Christ. Of course, persecution was soon to follow. The persecution at that point primarily coming from the unbelieving Jews. They were upset that Paul and Barnabas taught not only that the Messiah had come, in the person of Jesus, but that the Hebrew Messiah was presented to Gentiles and that even Gentiles were invited to be saved. And so these people followed Paul and Barnabas around, stirring up troubles for these missionaries at every opportunity. And of course, it didn't stop with the work uh, of those people and the gospel work itself did not stop. Paul and Barnabas remained faithful to their calling. And their success, by the way, was evident by all of these churches that were planted in these various cities. Eventually, they return home to Antioch of Syria, and their home church rejoices at the work of God, and they got back to the mission field right where they were there in Antioch. Now, that's where the controversy began. Acts 15 opened by showing the arrival of the Judaizers. These were men who taught that Jesus is the Lord God Messiah, but they also taught that believing Gentiles needed to undergo circumcision, according to the Hebrew law, and obey the law of Moses. They believe that in order for Gentiles to become the people of God, they needed to become Hebrews in addition to becoming Christian. If they were going to worship the Jewish Messiah, then they needed to become Jewish themselves. Otherwise, they said it was impossible for them to be saved. So now turmoil erupts in the Antiochian church. It's clear that something needed to be done. Paul and Barnabas are sent down to Jerusalem to settle the issue with the mother church that's there, the remaining elders and the apostles that are there. The Judaizing teachers had apparently come from Judea, uh, Jerusalem, and they claimed the authority of Jerusalem, so that's where the question needed to be answered. Everybody gathered together. It's quite the debate. You had different men taking different sides of the issue. That's when Peter stood up to speak. And he reminded them, you might recall, that the question had been settled by God really 10 years prior, back when Peter first shared the gospel with Cornelius, a Roman centurion that was living in Caesarea in Acts chapter 10. Peter and those who were with him witnessed firsthand how the Holy Spirit intervened among the Gentiles, bringing Cornelius and his whole household to faith. In fact, brought him to faith even before Peter got done preaching his message. And the whole group of believing Gentiles was filled with the Spirit. They were speaking in tongues just like the 12 apostles had done on the day of Pentecost and the birth of the church. God had made no distinction between Jew and Gentile in the gift of his Spirit and in the gift of his salvation. And if God did not make a distinction then, how could the church do so now, Peter knew that he and the other Jewish Christians had been saved by grace through faith, and that's exactly how the Gentile Christians were saved too. So Peter had reminded the Jerusalem church of their history, given this tremendous word of wisdom. But of course, the problem remained. After all, his was just one voice out of many. What next? Well, the question remains unsettled, unsolved. That's when James speaks up, providing another word of wisdom by going back to the Scriptures showing God's eternal plan to save the Gentiles, and he suggests a plan for the Gentiles to remain Gentiles, just godly ones. Church agrees, they send forth this letter proposing the same. So the day began with these questions, but at the end of the day, they finally knew what to do, what to say. They needed to affirm the truth, affirm freedom, affirm grace. Guys, so do we. Too often we put rules and rituals and restrictions in the way of our freedom, Instead of promoting just a humble holiness, we preach a legalistic way of living that binds us and binds others. We need to beware. We can easily find ourselves getting in the way of the things that God is doing. He may be calling somebody to repentance and we become a stumbling block in the way. He may be calling us to simple faith, but his grace seems so simple, too simple to believe, so we insert something else, something else that we can manage. Beware of imposing legalism, either on yourself or on someone else. God calls us to walk in freedom, not legalism. So we affirm truth, we affirm freedom, affirm grace. So we'll start here with James's counsel in verse 12, well, really 12 through 21. But what do we do? We affirm the truth here, 
really starts with Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul in verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. Stop there. Peter, remember, just concluded his testimony, reminding how God had worked through him in the past. And that's when these two missionary apostles from Antioch spoke up. Barnabas and Paul, you might recall earlier in chapter 15, had already shared with the apostles and the elders, the church of Jerusalem, what God had done through them on the mission field, verse 4. Now they told their story again. Now, to be sure, this probably wasn't simple repetition. They likely filled in some details they hadn't shared earlier, maybe before they just shared the basics. But now with Peter reminding everybody how God had given the Gentiles a Holy Spirit, and miraculously they all spoke in tongues. At this point, Barnabas and Paul now share the miracles and the wonders God had worked. Just like God had given evidence of his empowerment of Cornelius, the Holy Spirit gave evidence of his work among the churches of Galatia. All these details are filled in by Barnabas and Paul. By the way, notice that Barnabas is again listed first. Uh, when they first started the mission trip, it was Barnabas, then Saul, then it got flipped to Paul, then Barnabas. Now Barnabas is listed first, and this seems to indicate Barnabas' lengthy history with the church in Jerusalem. On the mission field, it made more sense for Paul to take the lead, but Barnabas had a much more substantial reputation back in Jerusalem. His testimony carried a lot of weight, so he took the, the lead there. Along these lines, please be aware of thinking one apostle is more valuable than the other. We think of Paul like he might be superior to Barnabas. That's not the case at all. Paul gave a great gift to us through the epistles, but God used Barnabas just as much in church planting, even when the two men go different directions. God does not love one Christian more than another Christian, right? He has different plans for us. He has different gifts for us, but he's given us one Savior, one Spirit. We're all valuable to him in Christ Jesus. But anyway, they speak and again, the emphasis in Barnabas and Paul's testimony is the work of God. We see this theme there. Back in chapter 14, verse 27, in Antioch, they reported all that God had done with them. Did the same thing in verse 4 in Jerusalem. They reported all things that God had done with them. After Peter's testimony, the miracles were the things God had worked through them. Never once did Barnabas nor Paul take credit for the mission. They didn't take credit for the conversions, not for the church plants, not for the signs and wonders. All of what happened was of God, done by God for God's glory and promotion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is so different than the self-promotion of so many people today. There are all kinds of preachers and evangelists that try to attach their name to everything. Why? Because at the end of the day, they've got something to sell. They're selling a brand. And the more they promote of themselves, the more money they make for their products. Not so for the apostles of the early church. Neither Peter, nor Paul, nor Barnabas, nor any of the others promoted themselves. They promoted Christ alone. It's God who does the work. It's God who gets the glory. Remember, Jesus declared that he was the one to build his church. Matthew 16, 18. Modern ministers ought to be careful not to get in the way. Interestingly, although the whole debate is centered over what God had done through Paul and Barnabas, what God was doing in these churches that were planted by them, that's all that is said of these two missionary apostles. Spent the last several chapters talking about them, but that's all that we have right here. They were sent by Antioch to find out the response of the Jerusalem church, but they are not prominent in the decision-making. Right? <laughs> Neither was Peter, for that matter. <laughs> we think of him as the first, uh, we don't, but many people think of him as the first pope. He gave his testimony, and that's it. They simply present one side of the story like a defense in a courtroom trial. It's up to the leadership in Jerusalem to serve as the jury. But you know, there's one more person to be heard. It's the jury foreman, James. Look at verse 13. And after they become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now, first things first, we've got to ask, which James is this? Scripture mentions men. Uh, we remember James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, one of the original 12 apostles, he was already martyred. We saw that in the book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 2. He's dead, so that's not him. There was another of the original 12 named James. Sometimes he's known as James the Less, but he's James the son of Alphaeus. Read about him in Luke 6, 15. Now, nothing's known of that particular James other than one mention of him in the book of Acts when he's in the upper room in Acts chapter 1. The third James, the most likely candidate of who's speaking here is 
someone who's sometimes called James the Just, but he's the half-brother of Jesus, another son of Mary, but his father actually was Joseph. And he's the author, by the way, of the epistle of James. He was specifically mentioned by Paul in the letter to Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, verse 9. He's specifically mentioned by Paul again in the first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5. So he was known by Paul and Luke and all the rest. And this seems to be that James is speaking here. Traditionally, it seems that James was the de facto leader of the Jerusalem church. He's well respected by the Jewish believers there in Jerusalem. All right, so that's who it was. But what did he say? Well, he affirmed the testimony of Peter. You might notice specifically of Simon Peter. James seems to purposefully use Peter's Hebrew name. And in fact, when you look at the Greek, it actually says Simeon, which is a more Hebraic form of that name. Now, whether this is force of habit on his part, because that's just how he was introduced to him, or if that's wisdom and how to relate to the Jewish faction there in the church, it's unclear, but no doubt it helped. It reinforced that the Jewish believers faced no threat from the mission to the Gentiles. Jewish Christians were not being asked to change anything. They just needed to consider what God was doing among a different culture of people. And God had been doing this for a while. Years ago, there had been some Jews that objected to Simon Peter's visit with Cornelius, but after hearing that initial story, they all glorified God. Acts chapter 11, right? Verse 18. So this is no different. So what had Simon? What did Simeon? What did Peter say? What did Simon say? Sounds like a children's game, right? What did Simon say? Well, he said that God had visited and he had called the Gentiles. Now, this is interesting because the word for visit, it comes from the same Greek word that we get the word episcopalian, episcopate, sometimes translated overseer or bishop, right? Is the word that means to look after, to examine, to inspect. God was visiting, examining these Gentiles, overseeing them, inspecting them for himself. The whole idea here is that God was not passive with the Gentiles coming to faith. This is not something that he just accepted as, you know, a byproduct of other things going on. This was God's plan. He actively ensured that Gentiles would hear the gospel and be saved. See, Simon Peter verified, Paul and Barnabas, they hadn't gone rogue. They were simply being used by God in the same way that Peter had been used by God years earlier. James now verifies all of this as an independent witness. Not only had God called the Gentiles, God said that he would call the Gentiles. This has been prophesied in Scripture. Look at verse 15. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things known to God from return to all his works. Now, some scholars have criticized this a bit because James seems to have given a loose rendering of the Greek version, the Septuagint, of Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. And some criticize that, saying, well, he was a, a Hebrew guy. There's no reason he would have quoted from a Greek text. Well, loose quotations of the Greek Septuagint are not uncommon in the church in the, the New Testament. We see it all over the place, and especially the The book of Matthew does that quite frequently, and that's the most Hebrew of all the Gospels, apparently. It should be noted that just like we have several English versions and translations today, the ancient Jews had different versions, translations of their scripture. Some were in Hebrew, some were not. All were available at that time, and sometimes they had slight variations between them. And so that James would quote a different version isn't unlike us. You know, at one point, remembering a verse in the version of the New King James, and another time we remember how it's listed in the ESV, and we say it differently different times. No different here. As a whole, the Hebrew text, the Greek text, they do agree. God told the prophet Amos that the tent, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of David, meaning his house, his royal dynasty, his tent would be rebuilt. Now, the kingdom had split in Amos's day, Eventually, both kingdoms would fall into judgment by God, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. But one day, God would restore all. In fact, in that day, the Hebrew kingdom would be expanded to cover Edom, a neighboring kingdom. In the Greek text, it said that. In the Hebrew text, it says that. But in the Greek text, it talked about how it would cover all mankind. And whichever translation one choose here, uh, the, the prophets do agree on this point is that the future son of David will be king not only over the Hebrews, but over all the world. And of course, that's exactly what we see in Jesus. 
He's come to give salvation, make it available to all peoples everywhere today. And when he comes back to reign in power and glory, he will rule and reign over all the peoples of the earth in the future. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. James's point here is that the millennial kingdom shows God's plan for the Gentiles. Because even Gentiles can be and are called by God's name. How wonderful it is that the covenant God of Israel reaches out beyond Israel. How amazing it is that the God of Abraham has a plan to save more than just the physical descendants of Abraham because we would be left hopeless if not. He has a plan to save Gentile people like you and me. And this has always been God's plan. This has always been his work. This has been known to him from when? Eternity past. It was the church that was now playing catch up with God regarding the international reach of the gospel, but it wasn't new by any stretch of the imagination. How far back did it go? It went back to the very beginning of time itself before there was time. God had this plan. In fact, Peter writes about this in his own epistle, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, all that pagan idolatry, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a bland without blemish and without spot, he was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead, gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. The plan of God for the world was always Jesus. See, this is why God could tell Adam and Eve at the moment of their fall, that God would send a Savior. Why is that? Because even before Adam formed, uh, be, before God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, God knew that Adam would need to be saved. Think about that. God created Adam knowing that Adam was going to sin, created him anyway. God created you knowing that you were going to sin, and he still formed you in your mother's womb. Isn't that a wonderful act of grace by itself? God always knew Adam would need to be saved. He always had this plan for redemption. Who exactly are Adam's descendants? <laughs> all of us. Not just the nation of Israel. All of humankind. We all require redemption. Redemption to have our souls, our eternities, purchased back from death. And none of us can be redeemed by ourselves, by our traditions, by our works, by our idolatries. We must be redeemed by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you received of His redemption? Have you answered the call of God when... <laughs> Jesus has called you to salvation. He makes it available to all. So we start to put this together. Paul and Barnabas had testified to the truth of God's work. James affirmed that Peter had also testified to the truth of God's work. And James additionally showed that God's word had been testified through the scriptures. So even if it could be argued that, you know, the agreed testimony between Peter and the missionaries, well, that's just a fluke. The Bible provides the ultimate authority. It was in the scriptures. God had said that he would save the Gentiles without making them Jews, by the way. And God obviously had been doing it, right? This was truth. This was fact. The only question was how the Jerusalem church would respond to it. And that's when James proposes a solution, verse 19. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. We see a few things here. One, what the Jewish Christians should not do. They should not trouble the Gentiles who are coming to faith in Christ. The Jewish Christians did not need to put a stumbling block. They did not need to put a difficulty in front of others. Why put the law of Moses upon people whom God was already calling outside of Moses? You might think of James saying something like this. These people are already turning to Christ. Don't make it harder for somebody who's already in the process of repenting. See, this was the problem of the Judaizers, but it's not limited to the Judaizers. People still do this today. Yeah. Instead of calling people to simple repentance and faith in Jesus, some still preach all kinds of legalism. You ever hear this? Don't bother walking into that church until you clean up your life first. You need to get your act straight, and then you can go to Jesus heard that many times. Guys, that's nothing less than modern day Judaizing. It's illogical and it's downright wrong. It's illogical 
in the fact that apart from the grace of God, we can't clean up our lives. The only thing we can do while we're in our sin is choose how much we're going to sin from day to day. We can sin a little, we can sin a lot, but that's it. But it takes the power of the Holy Spirit in someone's life in order for his or her life to change. So it's illogical. But the main problem is this. It's anti-gospel because it places the emphasis on the work of man rather than the work of Jesus. We cannot save ourselves. We must be saved. So it doesn't matter what actions and behaviors that change in our lives if we haven't yet surrendered ourselves to Jesus. A relatively moral pagan or unbeliever is just as lost as an obviously immoral one. Now, what's needed is that someone come to Christ first, and then Jesus cleans up our lives. Now, be careful neither to believe the false teaching of the modern-day Judaizers. Be careful not to teach it yourself. It's easy for Christians to impose a similar kind of legalism upon ourselves or on others under the guise of holiness, but in the reality of works-based religion. Let grace be grace. We were saved by the grace of God. Beware that you don't stand in the way of somebody else being saved by his grace either. So that's what Jewish Christians should not do. But what should Gentile Christians not do? Well, they should engage in common paganism. See, here's the balance. James, Peter, Paul, Barnabas, and all the rest, they all agree that Gentiles should not be forced to convert to Judaism, but none of them believe that the Gentiles ought to remain as they were. Not once do we ever find Paul giving permission for an idolater to remain an idolater. Paul and all the apostles call men and women to repentance. Once we turn to Christ in humble faith, we don't receive of his grace going to him, and then turn back around and start walking the other direction again. No, we stay turned towards Christ, always walking towards him. Yeah, we stumble from time to time, we mess up, but we don't try to claim his promises and then run back to the world. Right? Now, specifically for James, he recommends that these Gentile believers abstain from certain things. And the idea is this full and intentional avoidance of certain practices that were common among other unbelieving Gentiles. He lists off four. Some count three, but really four here. First is things polluted by idols. Uh, Gentiles were not to partake in idolatrous foods or practices if it had been contaminated. I like the way the New American Standard puts that. Contaminated by idolatry, that thing needed to be avoided. Uh, now, we don't regularly encounter meat sacrificed to idols today, but we would be wise to avoid practices that have obvious pagan foundations. If it's rooted in Hinduism and Buddhism and atheism, whatever, we need to be very mindful and wary of that. Right? Things polluted, contaminated by idols. Then it's got sexual immorality. The Greek word here is recognizable, porneia. You hear that in the word pornography. And it refers to fornication or any sexual act outside of the sanctity of marriage. It's hypocritical for Christians to claim to be following Jesus when engaging in sexual habits outside of what he has ordained. Stay away from those things. Then he says, stay away from things strangled. What, what, what does that have to do with anything? Uh, one lexicon puts it this way, of talking about animals that are killed without having the blood drained from them, animals that have not been properly slaughtered. And of course, that leads into the fourth thing, this abstention from blood, just general prohibition from consuming blood overall. Now, those first two are kind of obvious to us. Those things make sense to us, easy to understand. But what about the second two, the things strangled in blood? Well, these were things, one, that are linked with paganism, Gentiles might drink the blood of an animal that they hunted or the blood of an animal that they sacrificed. Uh, by the way, that hasn't really vanished today. It's not just in foreign cultures. <laughs> uh, we, there is such a thing called blood sausage today in Europe, right? Same, same sort of thing. But even so, those things that are prohibited in the Mosaic law, James is not suggesting Jewishness and how to slaughter an animal according to kosher law and drain the blood, all the rest. Although this is prohibited in the law of Moses, it goes beyond Moses. Where does it go? Does it go all the way back to Noah? See, we read this in Genesis 9, verses 3 and 4. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, God speaking. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Uh, sometimes we forget, but prior to the flood, mankind was vegetarian, if not vegan. And that's why a lot of people are so grateful to be born after the flood, I suppose. Yeah. But... After the flood, God permitted men and women to eat meat, but 
with the specific prohibition against blood. And the blood was life, symbolically speaking. Life belonged to God. So here in Acts 15, James is not commanding a Hebrew kosher diet for Gentiles from the law of Moses. No, he goes back to the refounding of the human race with God's command to Noah and all who descended from him. Who have descended from Noah? All of us, right? Even the Gentiles were bound to God's covenant with Noah. So that had nothing to do with legalism. It had to do with basic godliness. The bottom line of what he's saying here, if you've been saved, act as if you've been saved. If you've been made a child of God, live as though God Almighty is your Father. So he wraps up his counsel here in verse 21. For Moses has had throughout many generations, those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Why not preach the law of Moses to the Gentiles? Well, because Moses is very well represented. And there are two different aspects of this. The first is, you know, the Jews in cities around the world, where these apostles are going to, ministering, preaching the gospel, they don't need extra offense from the Gentiles who claim to believe in the Messiah. You know, the gospel of Christ is offensive enough, and it's meant to be so. It's a stumbling block. But to have Jewish, excuse me, but to have Gentile Christians flaunting ungodly behavior in front of these Jews, that doesn't help the Great Commission. That doesn't help bring more Jews to Christ. So don't do it from that aspect. But secondly, Moses didn't need the church to promote him. If somebody wanted to learn how to be Jewish, all they needed to do is go walk into the local synagogue. Yes, the church preached and they, they taught the scriptures, but they didn't promote and teach the ritualistic ceremonial law. All that had been fulfilled in Jesus, which Jesus said he'd come to do. He didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it, Matthew 5, 17. And if Jesus did not impose the law of Moses upon the Gentiles that he reached in his ministry, why should the church? All right, so all this, this is the truth. It had been you know, testified by the missionaries. It had been prophesied in the scriptures. It had been promoted by James. The way forward ought to have been clear. What would the church decide? Well, that's what comes next, Jerusalem's decision. Right, first they affirm truth, and now they need to affirm freedom, starting in verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. The church agreed. What James and the others said had pleased the apostles and the elders. They considered this matter carefully, as they should have done, and they agreed to what these other godly men had said. They acted upon it. By the way, you might note that the plan was agreed upon by the whole church. Right? This wasn't a dictate from James. The Pope of Jerusalem church said this has gone on. That's not the case at all. No, it was agreed by the apostles, the elders, with the whole church. They were in unified agreement together. Having unity in the Spirit is wonderful confirmation to the truth. Wonderful confirmation of what a right course of action might be. When Christians claim to be led of the Spirit to opposite conclusions, something's wrong. Because the Spirit is not going to contradict Himself. If He's leading a church, He's going to be leading it in the same direction. And so this decision is made to send word back to Antioch via this chosen delegation. And of course, uh, now they've got witnesses. You don't just have uh, this word coming forth. You've got witnesses that can testify to this. Paul and Barnabas are obvious choices to go. They need to go back home anyway. They're accompanied by Judas Barsabbas and Silas. We don't know anything about Judas Barsabbas other than this. He had a very common name in the day, but this is the only time he's mentioned in Scripture. Silas is going to factor in very heavily in future chapters. He's going to be the future traveling companion of Paul introduced here. Verse 23, they wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Sometimes we think that, you know, once we get to the book of Romans, we'll get to the first epistle of the church. Or we think chronologically, you know, the first epistle written to the church was the book of Galatians. Um, this is actually the first one written down that's included in the scripture, right? And just like Paul and Peter and other apostles would write to various churches, the apostles in Jerusalem wrote to the church of Antioch. And it wasn't just the church of Antioch, but all the churches that were planted by them, impacted by them. You know, the question of Judaism, it, uh, Judaizing, it first arrived in Antioch, but you know, false teaching has a tendency to spread, just like mold. <laughs> and so that's what was going on there. They were trying to cut it off. So they began, I love this, don't miss this, with a greeting from brothers to brothers. 
Just like the apostles and elders, they were brothers together in Jerusalem and Christ along with the rest of the church. So were these Gentile Christians who come to faith in Antioch and beyond. Right off the bat, they affirm their common bond in Christ. They're not calling their salvation into question. They might be Gentiles, but they're fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus. Verse 24, since we've heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Now, the first thing they do is acknowledge the problem. <coughs> problem well defined is half solved, as a uh, friend of mine used to say quite often. They knew the teaching of the Judaizers was troubling and unsettling. It's interesting, by the way, this word for troubling is different in verse 24 than it was in verse 19. In verse 19, the word for troubled was to cause unnecessary difficulty. In verse 24 is to cause inward turmoil. It's a stronger word. Why is that? Well, perhaps James earlier was cautioning the Jerusalem church for causing extra difficulty for this Gentile church that had already experienced such turmoil back at home. Their very souls had been unsettled. Legalistic teaching unsettles our souls. This is when born-again Christians start to call their own salvation into question. This is when we start doubting whether or not we're, we're really saved. Now, before I explain that a little bit more, don't get the wrong idea. If a person is caught up in a sinful habit, sinful lifestyle, he or she should question his or her salvation. Paul wrote that much to the Corinthian church when he told them to examine themselves to see if they were in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Likewise, the apostle John made it clear. When someone's claiming to be a Christian habitually, ongoingly, walks the opposite of how Jesus walked, he said, well, that person's a liar. 1 John 2, 3. But that's not what is in view right here. Right? What the Gentiles dealt with in Antioch, that's the other extreme of this. And that's when everything about their salvation was questioned just because they weren't Jewish. Right? This is a situation where they fully, truly trusted the Lord Jesus, believing on Him, crucified for their sins, resurrected from the dead, loving Him with their hearts and their minds. But all of a sudden now, that doesn't matter because they're not circumcised. They had engaged in these external rituals that others said they ought to engage in. It's like when Christians are told today, you say you're saved, but, you know, your radio station presets are different than my radio station presets. That sounds silly, but people get that kind of legalistic trip put on them. We hear it today, you say you're saved, but you don't use the same Bible translation I do. You, you say you're saved, but, you know, you give less in your offering every month than I do. You give off the net, I give off the gross. I, that's Christian legalism. It's unsettling. It takes believers' eyes off Jesus and puts them on the one preaching the bondage. And it's wrong. So right from the beginning, the Jerusalem church acknowledges this problem. They say this was wrong. It was unsettling and it was unnecessary because the Jerusalem leadership, they hadn't commanded this. Now, these Judaizers arrived in town saying that they come with apostolic authority, but they had none. The true apostolic teaching would be affirmed in the Scriptures, confirmed by godly witnesses, and so that's what this letter is trying to straighten out. All right, verse 25, It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second thing they do is they affirm their unity on the matter. Although we saw earlier there was a lot of argument, dispute, verse 7, there was dispute, all kinds of debate going on there. It had all been resolved. Now the apostles, the elders, the other, they're in just as much agreement on this as they had been on the day they first received the Holy Spirit. The same words used there, the same one accord, homo thumidon. They were you know, unified by God, by the internal witness of the Spirit, the written word of the prophets, and the external witness of godly testimony that brought them into one accord together. It's wonderful to be in spirit-led unity. That's the standard to which we ought to strive in all our decisions. And in their unity, they affirm the ministry of Barnabas and Paul. Now, can you imagine when this letter goes back to Antioch and they're reading this out loud and the Judaizers sitting right there in the room, what a blow that would have been to the Judaizers attempting to undermine Barnabas and Paul. They spent all this time trying to say that their ministry didn't count. They were only halfway there. Now the apostles back in Jerusalem said, no, they're beloved. They did the right thing. 
You know, the Antiochian church, they, they had rejoiced to hear of what had happened during this missionary journey. Now, all of that had been called into doubt because of these false teachers. The Jerusalem church basically said, what Barnabas and Paul did, it was wonderful. It was of the Lord, and it should have been obvious. How so? Because the Judaizers, oh, they came preaching what they preached, but they hadn't risked anything to spread their legalism. Paul and Barnabas, though, they had put their lives on the line to teach the gospel of grace. Literally, it could be said that Barnabas and, Barnabas and Paul delivered or they committed their souls for the name of Jesus. They had given everything to Jesus, knowing the gospel is worth everything. Verse 27, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So they affirmed God's will through the church. Again, through scripture, through testimony, through counsel, they now had the command of the Holy Spirit. That all confirmed the command of the Holy Spirit to them. What was it that was good to God the Spirit in regard to the Gentile churches? Freedom was. Freedom. God was not calling these Gentiles to become Jews. He called them to be saved. And that's enough. You know, for a Jewish person to try to be faithful, totally faithful to the law, which is impossible, they had 613 commands to keep. Now, that's one thing if that's your culture and that's your upbringing, because the Jews had all kinds of ways of justifying themselves in these things. Paul even admitted to this much. You might recall in Philippians 3, 6, he said he was blameless concerning the righteousness that is found in the law. So they had ways of justifying themselves in these 613 commandments. But you know, that's the Jews. It's totally different for the Gentiles. All they knew, <laughs> I'm no longer a pagan. I'm no longer an idol worshiper. I'm no longer an atheist, agnostic, an apathetic non-believer, whatever today, right? Jesus said, free them from sin, free them from death, free them from ignorance. So how could anyone place any further burden upon them and weigh them down? So no other burden except what? Verse 29, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality, if you keep yourself from these, you'll do well. So they affirm all of James's godly counsel, this basic morality and freedom. They, you know, detail the basics of what James said. He used it a little different order, but no change in the meaning. You know, the bottom line in this letter was that Christian godliness was upheld. Jewish conversion was not. The Gentiles did not become Jews to be pleasing to God. God had already made them pleasing to him through the work of Jesus. Everything else is follow through. Once free in Jesus, stay free in Jesus. That's something Paul personally confirmed to his own letter to these same Galatians at the end of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made you free, made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Legalism, specifically circumcision here, but legalism as a whole is slavery. It's slavery. Whether that comes from well-meaning believers trying to impose Jewish faithfulness to the feasts, to the Sabbath, to circumcision. Whether it comes from well-meaning believers claiming that you know, other Christians have to believe and act exactly the way they believe and act in order to be assured of salvation. Or whether it comes from some straight-out false teacher purposefully imposing law on someone else to prove himself more spiritual. Don't do it. Neither allow yourself to be brought under bondage, nor extend bondage to anyone else. We have but one Lord and Master, the Lord Jesus. Our hope is in him alone. So we live steadfastly in the freedom given us by Christ. It's the first major controversy of the church that threatened the core of the gospel message itself. Would Gentile Christians live in the freedom granted them by Jesus, or would the works of men and religion have to be done to confirm their salvation? The answer is clear. Through the testimony of God's work on the mission field, through the testimony of God's word in the scripture, through the unified testimony of God's people in his church, will of God's made known. The truth of the gospel was affirmed, and that was for God's people to live in freedom. We need to affirm that truth. We need to affirm that freedom, which is affirming grace. May we be those who cherish the freedom we have in Christ.
not flaunting it to the point of sin, not using it as an excuse to live in ungodly pagan ways, but using our freedom to worship God in spirit and in truth and rejoicing in the salvation and grace poured out us in Jesus. Some of you today, I know this for a fact because I know some of your backgrounds, not everybody, some of you have had legalism forced on you. Be free. Jesus has freed you, so don't allow yourselves to be chained by the expectation of others. You are not bound by Jewish law. You're not bound by cultural expectations. If you have repented and placed your faith in Jesus alone for forgiveness and salvation, the only one to whom you're bound is Christ. So walk in the freedom he's given, giving honor and glory to him. I would implore all of us to extend that same freedom to others. Preach the gospel of grace. Tell others how they can find freedom from rituals, freedom from the works of men, freedom from the slavery of sin. Show them their freedom in Christ and help them walk in it. And maybe you're here today and that's a freedom you've not personally experienced. You find yourself still in bondage to sin and death. Jesus offers you forgiveness, freedom, and life. And you can experience that today as we close. Father, thank you so much for giving Jesus for us. He paid the price. He fulfilled the law. He did everything that was required so that we might be saved. Lord, I would pray for those who have not yet received of his forgiveness, received of his grace, found freedom that they have in you. Call them this moment and help them respond. Help them see their sin for what it is. Forsake it. Turn to Christ, grab hold of him, and trust themselves to Jesus, knowing that Jesus is their only hope. Lord, you give them the words, but help them call upon Christ now in sincerity, conviction, knowing that Jesus is God in the flesh who died for them at the cross, rose from the grave, lives today as Lord. Help them surrender themselves to Christ and receive his forgiveness now. Lord, for the rest of us, help us walk in freedom. Help us not be hypocrites imposing legalism, but guard us from the legalism that would be thrust upon us. Help us rejoice in your grace and just simply let grace be grace. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.